Hello folks and welcome to this service for the Sunday after Easter from Gary Fergus Methodist Church. Well, actually it's coming from my study in Harwood Gardens. Uh, I do hope that uh, in this week since uh, the resurrection, you have known something of the living power of Christ in your life as we have lived together through these difficult times of uh, shutdown and of illness and potential threats. We know that God is with us and God will neither leave us nor forsake us. And whatever our worries and fears, we can put our trust in him. This morning, I want to take us again to, to John's Gospel. Uh, we'll have a story, an Easter story, uh, which uh, hopefully, if my editing skills are up to it, will fit into the, the service uh, with um, Nikki's um, help. And uh, we'll come to that um, shortly. Uh, but let's just begin as we turn our thoughts to God and ask for his guidance and his blessing as we pray. Our loving God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together, even if it is just in this way through the uh, internet. And whether we are gathered together um, on uh, Sunday morning at about 11, or perhaps we are uh, tuned in at some other time of the day. May it be that each one of us uh, senses your presence with us and hears your voice, uh, recognizes your face and enjoys being in your presence. Uh, perhaps we're watching with someone else in our household. Uh, perhaps we are literally on our own uh, whatever the case, we thank you, Lord, that you are always with us and that we can sense your nearness. And we pray that through this uh, short service uh, that we will hear from you and that your word will come alive and that you will speak a word of challenge, of encouragement, of correction, and perhaps even a rebuke uh, to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Our Bible reading is again from John's Gospel and we carry on from where we left off on Easter Sunday. On Easter Sunday we were thinking about the uh, disciples uh, who came to the tomb after um, the women had come and found the Jesus body was gone. They thought someone might have stolen it. Uh, James um, Sorry, uh, John and uh, Peter uh, run to the tomb. Um, the younger man gets there first, but hesitates. Peter charges in, uh, sees the grave clothes um, as if the body has risen up through them. And then John goes in too, and they believe. And then Jesus has this wonderful encounter with Mary Magdalene. And as he speaks her name, she uh, recognizes him. Uh, there have been other things that have happened in this day. Um, Luke's gospel tells us about how two of the disciples are disconsolate and walking uh, away from Jerusalem towards Emmaus. And Jesus appears to them and has a wonderful conversation with them, though they don't recognize him until he breaks bread with them. Their eyes are opened and they know it's the Lord and they rush back to Jerusalem. And here's John's account, verse 19 of John chapter 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand and place it into my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, you have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name and we thank God for the reading of his holy word now uh, boys and girls we're going to have a little story now that Nikki is going to uh, read for you. I'm hoping that I'm not breaking any copyright um, laws by um, doing this. Uh, the book, I just bought it this week, actually, from the Good Book Company. They produce it. Great stuff to get books, a great place to get books from. Uh, written by Tim Thornbury and the pictures by uh, Jennifer Davison. Um, so uh, hopefully the, the pictures will appear. I've um, scanned them or copied them and then Nikki will read uh, the story and I do hope that you'll join in and I don't know whether there's anybody around you will be able to take a picture or two of your faces as Nikki reads the story and uh, maybe some of them might get posted on our WhatsApp group um, or in some other way. So here's Nikki with our story this morning for the boys and girls. A Very Happy Easter, written by Tim Thornborough and illustrated by Jennifer Davison. This book is a bit different from others. In most books, there is work for your eyes and ears. You look at the pictures and listen to the words. But in this book, there is work for your face too. You will see the faces of lots of people who were there at the first Easter when Jesus died and rose again. Every time you see one, try to copy the face they are making and think about how they would have felt. Are you ready? Then let's begin. Jesus came to the city of Jerusalem, a huge excited crowd Welcome Jesus. They knew that he was the promised king. Can you make an excited face? Like the children waving their branches? But some people did not want Jesus to be in charge. So they sent soldiers to arrest him. They hated Jesus because he said he was the son of God. Now, can you make a cross face like the soldiers? Wow, those are very scary faces. They put King Jesus on a cross to die. Jesus' friends were very scared. Can you make frightened, scared faces now? Jesus died and his friends cried. Show us your sad, crying face. They buried Jesus in a rock tomb and put a big heavy stone over the door. Jesus' friends were so sad. 
Let's see those sad faces again. On the third day, early in the morning, some women came to the tomb, but the stone was rolled away. Jesus was not there. They were so confused. Can you make your face look like you don't understand? That's what being confused means. Make it look like it's all oh, you're really surprised. Very good. Some angels appeared. They said, he is not here. He is risen, just as he promised. The women were astonished. Now, let's see those big surprised faces. Let me see your eyebrows go up. Well done. The women ran and told Jesus' friends what they had seen, what the angels had said. He is risen, but they didn't believe them. Now, can you make a, what are you talking about kind of face? A face like you don't believe what you're hearing. Suddenly, Jesus was right with them. He spoke to them. He ate with them. He showed them his hands and feet. He really was alive again. Jesus' friends were startled, afraid, amazed, confused. Can you do one of those faces? Or maybe you can do all four. That will really give your face a workout. Wow, well done, that's super. Your faces are working really hard. Don't be afraid, said Jesus. It really is me. I died and now I am alive again. Now you can be friends with God forever. Jesus' friends were happy, happier, the happiest they had ever been in their whole lives. Let's see lots of happy faces. Get those really big smiles going. Yay, well done. Then King Jesus sent his friends to tell everyone the good news. They happily spread the message all over the world. And now you have heard the message about King Jesus and how he died and rose again so that we can be with friends with God forever. What face will you make now? Well done. Do your faces ache now? So, thank you very much uh, to Nikki for um, reading that story for us. Now, we come to John's Gospel again and to chapter uh, 20 from verse 19 onwards. Uh, if you've got your Bible, uh, do open it again, as I often say, um, and follow through. Um, I have the text um, beside me here, or in front of me, and I'll read bits of it again. We've read this, the whole story through in one uh, reading, but I want to take it in little chunks. Uh, make a few comments as we go through, and then come to some um, conclusions. It's Easter day. Jesus is risen from the dead. The women have gone to the tomb to complete the anointing of his body with spices. Their worry being who would open the tomb for them, who would roll the heavy stone away. Uh, when they get there, of course, the stone is gone, uh, rolled away. As someone famously once said, uh, the stone wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. It was rolled away to let the women and the disciples in and Mary uh, looks in runs to the disciples they uh, come to investigate this remarkable thing that they don't really believe but when they get there and look inside uh, see the grave clothes uh, and Jesus body gone as if uh, evaporated up through uh, the, the, the grave clothes uh, that's why I say I don't think that the stone was rolled away to let Jesus out uh, he would have got out of the tomb, even with the stone still uh, in front of it. And we get a little sense of that as we look at this, um, some of the details in this story um, in the evening. And then, of course, there was that lovely story of the encounter with, with Mary Magdalene. 
thinking that this figure behind her was a gardener. She asked, where is, where have you put him? If you take him away, tell me, I'll get him. And, uh, and then um, Jesus uh, just calls her name, Mary, and she recognizes him. In the evening then, <clears throat> we read that the disciples were in a room, possibly the same room that they had been in before in the upper room where Jesus had been teaching them. And the doors were locked, we're told, for fear of the Jews. Uh, the Jews, the ruling council, have had Jesus um, tried, uh, falsely found guilty and executed. Uh, they have been ruthless in what they have done. And so perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that these little, uh, this little bunch of disciples are scared. Uh, and so the doors are locked. And Jesus comes in, just like Jesus could get out of the tomb without the stone being rolled away. He could come into the room without the door being opened. Now, don't ask me to explain uh, the mechanics or the physics or the biology of all of that. Uh, I don't know. Um, it, it does point us, though, to this reality that there is another world. Uh, that other world intersects with ours, but it is distinct. And so it seemed that Jesus was able to come and go into rooms that were locked and to appear with a real uh, physical body and yet um, different in some ways. And he appears to them and says, uh, peace be with you. Now, at one level, that's just the normal greeting that uh, someone would have um, made in those days. A uh, little more perhaps than saying, um, how are you? Or uh, what about you? Um, and it's, of course, uh, in, in Greek. John has written in, in Greek. Uh, but the word in Aramaic or in Hebrew is one that we would be familiar with. Uh, it's the word shalom, um, which can simply mean peace. Um, <clears throat> but it, it, it can and often does. Uh, have a greater significance than simply a greeting. Um, shalom is um, is your well-being. Um, uh, if you have shalom, it's not just that you're chilled out of it and you're feeling okay today. Uh, it is, as we sometimes sing, uh, well with my soul. Uh, to know the peace of God that passes all understanding, uh, that defies explanation, uh, so that in spite of our circumstances, whether we are ill or healthy, uh, whether we have COVID-19 or um, nothing wrong with us at all, uh, we can still have that shalom, that peace, that uh, knowledge that it is well with us in our relationship with God. And so uh, Jesus appears to his um, disciples. Um, there are a number of appearances, no doubt the Gospels um, and Paul uh, doesn't um, record all of the appearances Jesus made necessarily, um, but that he appeared to uh, different groups of people, different individuals in different circumstances at different times it is all a significant part of the evidence for the resurrection. Uh, these can't have been uh, hallucinations. Uh, these weren't um, tricks of the light. Uh, these were real physical appearances that Jesus made. And he convinced the disciples that he was alive. In verse 20, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Striking that, isn't it? Um, I wonder, has it ever occurred to you, uh, wh what was his face like? Um, usually you would recognize somebody um, from their their face. I know sometimes people have a, uh, a strange walk or uh, maybe um, you can tell them from the back of their head if you know them well. Uh, there might be other ways you might recognize a person. But generally speaking, we recognize one another when we see each other's faces and human faces are remarkable and our ability to recognize different faces uh, is uh, remarkable. But they didn't recognize him, it seems, from his face. 
Um, you remember just uh, earlier in the same chapter, Mary Magdalene in the garden sees this figure, sees his face presumably, uh, but doesn't recognize that it's Jesus until he speaks to her and he re and she recognizes uh, his voice and the way that he says uh, her name. The same for the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus in the Gospel of Luke. Um, Jesus appeared with them and again, now Luke says specifically that they were kept from recognizing him and it wasn't until he breaks bread with them in the home uh, that they uh, that they recognize him. Uh, but I, I just think this is striking. He showed them his hands and his side. It was the marks of his crucifixion that were the clear evidence of his identity. And you know, I wonder sometimes if in glory, uh, Jesus will be the only one who still has scars. Um, there are many of us who will have various scars and infirmities and disabilities and, uh, and things that will have happened to us either from birth or throughout our life. Um, in our resurrection bodies, uh, we will have bodies that are perfect and you won't suffer from arthritis and poor eyesight and a whole host of other ailments. All of those will be redeemed. But you know, I wonder whether throughout eternity, Jesus will still carry those scars, those marks in his hands and his side. And that's how we will know him. He is the Lord because he is the Lord who has died for us. And then verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace with you. And then this commission, as the father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Friends, if we are amongst those who are his disciples, who are witnesses of his resurrection, who have received the Holy Spirit and know that he is our Lord, our living, risen Lord, then we are, we are his servants and he is, he is sending us on a mission. Uh, all of us are missionaries. All of us are sent to uh, make the good news about Jesus known to others. I'm sending you. That wasn't just those 11 apostles. I think that message, uh, that commission is for all of us. Now, you might not go to the far ends of the world, uh, to a different culture and climate and have to learn a different language and all of those other things that some missionaries do. But if it's just being a witness to your neighbors and to your work colleagues and to your grandchildren, uh, that is part of the mission that Jesus is sending you to. In verse 22, when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this passage uh, or this verse uh, has caused uh, commentators and uh, theologians uh, a good deal of angst and uh, concern and confusion perhaps even and they wonder is this uh, a conflict um, with what uh, Luke writes in the book of Acts if you recall the account in Acts chapter 2 of the day of Pentecost and uh, some people wonder you know how could uh, how could this be if Jesus gives them or they you know, says to them receive the Holy Spirit and and metaphorically um, breathes on them, uh, is, is that a, a contradiction with Acts chapter 2? Well, you'll not be surprised, of course, that I don't think that there are contradictions in the Bible. Uh, there are um, puzzles and difficulties and things that we may or may not be able to fully grasp or explain. Uh, years and years ago, uh, the best uh, explanation I um, heard of this uh, little difficulty, uh, which still sticks in my mind, I share it with you now, uh, is really quite um, simple. If I were to give you a thousand pounds right now, uh, what would you think? Well, you think our David's very generous, isn't he? Um, <clears throat> now, I could give you uh, the thousand pounds in 
20 pound notes. Or maybe I might give you a check. Suppose I gave you a check for a thousand pounds. Have I given you the money or not? And you say, well, you give me a check. Uh, what, what do you do with the check? Well, you've got to go to, got to, go to the bank and either lodge it in your account uh, or get the bank to give you the cash in uh, 20 pound notes. You see the point? Uh, when I have given you the check, I have given you something. I, I have given you the money. But there's another sense in which you haven't quite got it in the way that you can fully um, use it yet. Uh, at the moment, the check is just a bit of paper. It's a, it's a, a um, it, it's a promise that when you present the check at the bank, you will get the real money. And I understand it a little bit like that. Here, Jesus is promising his disciples in the context of his commission to them to go and do this work of mission. They're not going to do it in and of themselves. Uh, you recall how in the first chapter of Acts, Jesus tells the disciples to wait in Jerusalem until they have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to go and do the work of mission. And here in this encounter on this first day of his uh, resurrection, uh, he's going to send them as the Father has sent him, and he symbolically breathes on them. It's reminiscent, isn't it, of the story in Genesis where God breathed life into um, Adam, made of the dust of the earth. When God breathed life into his nostrils, he became a living being. Or the story in Ezekiel 37 where God breathed into the dead bones and there is life. And then I think we come again to this question of uh, the mission. And again, it's a verse that has puzzled some people. Verse 23, if you forgive the sins of anyone, <clears throat> they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now, some of our Roman Catholic friends might interpret this in a particular way that I think uh, isn't um, necessarily correct. Uh, the, the idea that God or Jesus gave to these um, 11 men, these apostles, uh, this apostolic um, power to forgive sins, which then they passed on to the bishops and the priests and so on. So if you go to the confession and you confess your sins to the priest, the priest will give you a penance of some kind and then he will be able to forgive your sins. Well, I suppose that is one possible interpretation and understanding of this verse. Um, I don't think it's the most helpful by any means. Um, because as you recall in a previous encounter uh, with uh, the uh, religious leaders of Jesus' day, uh, they took umbrage at him when he uh, forgave the sins of the paralyzed man. You remember the story? When the man is let down through the roof, his mates um, bring him to Jesus. The house is full. They open a hole in the roof and let the man down. And as this paralyzed man uh, lies at the feet of Jesus, Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. And there's a sharp intake of breath and a lot of tutting. And this, uh, the, the religious uh, leaders say, uh, this is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And of course, they were right. And the point that Jesus was making on that occasion, as you recall of course was that he did that he did have that authority uh, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk does the man get up and walk proving that he did have the authority to forgive his sins you see this is this is the heart of mission isn't it uh, the mission that we are being sent on the mission that the disciples were sent on was the missing the mission of the gospel of forgiveness the main thing in the gospel is a new relationship with God. And the thing that spoils your relationship with God is, of course, your sin. The biggest problem you have, friends, is your sin. Uh, you might not uh, immediately recognize that. You might think you've got a whole host of other problems. And I don't doubt that uh, many of you have got many things that weigh you down. But the biggest problem you have is your sin and your greatest need is forgiveness and God will forgive your sins when you come to Christ when you confess your sins to him and he will forgive you 
because he has died for you. For he himself bore your sins in his own body on the tree. And he opens up a new living relationship with God. If sins are forgiven, they are forgiven. If they're not, they're not. Friends, that's a very somber note because there are those to whom the disciples would preach uh, this message of forgiveness and they would not have it. They would not let Jesus wash their sins away. And if Jesus does not wash their sins away and they die in their sins, then they are lost. Now we come to <clears throat> this lovely little story of Thomas. Verse 24. Now Thomas, uh, whose nickname was the twin, uh, Thomas is an Aramaic name, uh, it means twin, Didymus uh, in Greek. Uh, he wasn't there uh, on that occasion. Um, every time I'm preaching on this passage, I, I can't help but making the little, um, the little jibe that uh, if you miss on Sunday, you might miss something special. So unless there's a good reason not to be at church, uh, well, I guess this week you've got a good reason. Um, but uh, in other time, normal times, uh, you never know what you're going to miss. And Thomas missed uh, something special. Uh, the other guys told him about it. They said, uh, we've seen the Lord. Um, <clears throat> but then Thomas says, uh, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, place my finger in the mark of the nails, I will never believe. Now, that's, of course, how Thomas gets his other nickname, uh, his more commonly known nickname of um, Doubting Thomas. Well, do you know, uh, I like Thomas. Um, in the other gospel, he mentioned just in passing in the list of the names of the disciples. Uh, he has a more prominent place in John's gospel. We've already come across this uh, the other couple of occasions when he has a small but a significant part in the story. In chapter 11, uh, you recall when Jesus is the other side and message has come from Martha and Mary that Lazarus is very ill and uh, Jesus delays so that Lazarus dies. And then Jesus says, let's go, uh, to which uh, the disciples say, but they're trying to kill you, Lord. Um, we can't go. Uh, but Jesus is going to go. And then Thomas says in verse uh, 16 of chapter 11, um, let's also go that we may die with him. I love that. Um, Thomas might be skeptical. Um, Thomas uh, might be a doubter, but he's committed. He was committed to Jesus 100%. So that uh, when the others complain that it's too dangerous, he says, no, let's go with him, that we may die with him. And then in chapter um, 14 and verse 5, you know, chapter 14, the teaching in the upper room, in my father's house are many rooms, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Uh, and uh, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And then Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Do you know, I love that. Um, I love people who are prepared to ask what might seem like a stupid question. Uh, some of us um, are afraid to ask uh, what might be a daft um, question uh, in case we look silly. Um, but really, uh, when you're talking to God, uh, there are no daft questions. If there's something you don't understand, uh, something you haven't grasped, ask him about it and uh, he will uh, answer you. If anyone lacks wisdom, uh, says James, uh, let him ask of God. If there's stuff in this that you don't understand, ask, ask God. You could ask me, I may or may not be able to answer your question if it's a Bible question, um, but search out, uh, don't just be content to sit in ignorance and in darkness uh, when something as important as this has been revealed uh, you really must understand it and believe it and so uh, thomas was that sort of bloke 
<clears throat> didn't understand something, you can ask, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And of course, you know, the answer that Jesus gives to him in the next verse. I am the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. It's good to ask questions like that. It's good to seek out the evidence and the answers. Now, perhaps you might criticize Thomas and say, well, uh, he should have believed what the other disciples said. And fair enough, I guess he should have done. But he wanted to be sure for himself. He wanted to satisfy himself that the answers were correct and that it made sense. And then um, we read verse 26, eight days later, they were together again. And this time Thomas was there and the door still locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, um, peace be with you. You know, I think those must have been a long eight days for Thomas. Uh, I dare say conversations were still going on. I'm sure that the other disciples had told and retold the story. And maybe they had indeed tried to convince Thomas that they weren't pulling his leg. Uh, they weren't being um, deceived. They weren't stupid. They really did see Jesus. They really were with him. And so I guess perhaps maybe uh, at this stage, Thomas's heart is already softened somewhat. So that when Jesus appears, uh, he's prepared for this. And Jesus says to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, put your hand in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Now, it may be the way that John has told the story, um, though I think even that would be significant, of course. There is no record of Thomas getting his little finger out and poking it in the nail marks. Now Jesus has appeared to him. He does believe. And Jesus, uh, willing to give to Thomas the evidence that he needed, evokes from him this response of faith. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God my Lord and my God. What a remarkable statement of faith. Jesus said, do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas believed. Thomas believed with his whole heart that this risen Lord Jesus in front of him now, offering to him his hands, is indeed risen from the dead. And he is the Lord. Not just the Lord, but my Lord. You recall how in the garden just some uh, week, uh, eight days previously, uh, Jesus appears to, uh, to, to Mary and calls her name. And then Mary says in Aramaic, uh, Rabboni, my teacher. Thomas answers, my Lord, but that's not all, my Lord and my God. Thomas has the insight to recognize that Jesus wasn't just a great teacher who walked through Palestine with him for those three years and then was executed. He is God, the one who has authority to forgive sins, who now also will commission Thomas, and as tradition has it, uh, we don't know for a fact for sure, but it's a fairly strong tradition that Thomas went all the way as far as India, proclaiming the gospel of forgiveness to all who would listen. And then Jesus says to Thomas, you have believed because you've seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. My friends, that's us, isn't it? Uh, we haven't seen the risen Christ in that physical sense. We haven't had the opportunity to poke our fingers into the nail prints. But the evidence is substantial. It is enough. 
For those who have a heart to believe, it is, it is clear. Jesus is risen from the dead. And he is my Lord and my God. And how blessed I am to believe this gospel message. And I pray that you too will believe it. You might still have questions, and that's okay. Thomas had questions. Thomas had to wait those eight days until he saw the Lord for himself. Now, I don't think the Lord Jesus is going to physically appear to you uh, walking down the street in Carrick Fergus this week. But if you've got questions, if you want to know if God is real, if Christ truly is the Son of God, and that he really died for you, and that he can really forgive your sins and give you a new life and give to you the Holy Spirit, then ask him and he will reveal himself to you. Seek and you will find. And then um, we come finally just to the last couple of verses in this chapter 20. Very well known um, couple of verses and I've often quoted them to you over this last year or two since we've been doing John's Gospel as we've gone through the uh, the seven signs that we've looked at so far and John says Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name just like Thomas did. Thomas saw the signs. Thomas believed that Jesus is the Lord, the Christ, the Son of God, and he had new life. That's what God offers to you. Two things. One, uh, some people think that uh, the book should end there. Uh, that looks like a conclusion, doesn't it? And we've still got chapter 21 to go. Well, in a couple of weeks time, we'll come to chapter 21 and I will give you uh, several reasons for believing without any doubt at all, at least in my mind, that chapter 21 really is the last chapter. It wasn't added on later. It's part of John's craft in the telling of the story. And the other thing then is that uh, these verses also raise a pertinent question. Jesus did all these signs in the presence of the disciples and many others as well. But these are written that you might believe. The question is, what about all those other people who saw the signs, who were there? Why didn't they believe? Or at least, why didn't so many of them not believe? And that's an interesting question to think about. So next Sunday morning, uh, we'll be going backwards in the gospel a little bit. We'll go to the end of chapter 12, where we will help, where we'll find um, something that will help us uh, to answer that question. But for now, for us, like Thomas, who have encountered the risen Christ, let us go on that mission that he has sent us to, to proclaim the good news of grace and forgiveness to all who will believe in the risen Christ and recognize him as Lord and Saviour, indeed, the very Son of God. Now we're going to spend just a few moments together in prayer as we come towards the end of our service. And I want us to pray for three or four, five different uh, things. I'll pray short prayers, uh, leave a short uh, pause of silence when you might um, in your heart and mind, uh, bring your own uh, prayers uh, related to that, uh, that topic um, to God. Let us pray. I want to begin, first of all, by praying for those uh, who have lost loved ones in recent times. And in this week past, I conducted a funeral service, just a very simple service to graveside uh, for David Armstrong, one of the members of our church. He hasn't been at church in recent years because of frailty. Um, but we remember him, his wife Maureen, and uh, their family. Our gracious God, we hold up before you those who are sorrowful. There are those, Lord, in our church family 
and we pray for them. There are many others, Lord, that we have heard about in the midst of this COVID-19 crisis. There are folks that we know of who have passed away with this virus and others who have passed away for many other reasons. Will you comfort and keep those who mourn, giving them a sense, Lord, of your presence and your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for those who are sick. And again, there are a number of members of our church family who are in hospital, and some with uh, COVID-19. Uh, others have COVID and are recovering at home. Uh, some are in hospital for surgery uh, or having recovered from surgery. Uh, others uh, who are having um, um, care, perhaps coming towards the end of their um, earthly journey and we pray for them we pray for those who care for them we pray for family and friends who watch over them we thank you lord for the prayer that surrounds us as a family of god in our church and now we hold up before you those who come to mind as we pray for those who are sick Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And then, Lord, we pray for our children and our young people. Uh, these are unusual times. Uh, the schools would have been off this week uh, for um, Easter holidays anyway, uh, but the boys and girls would have been returning to school on Monday and some preparing for exams and so on. And all of that is so different now. But Lord, we pray that uh, you will uh, bless our children and our young people, that through this period that their education will not suffer unduly. Uh, bless uh, mums and dads and maybe others in the family too who are helping to school at home. Bless our teachers who are still trying to communicate through the internet and in other ways uh, with young people and children uh, to help them to continue with their education. And so Lord, we just hold up before you all of the uh, children and young people uh, in our church family, in our circle, wider circle of family and friends. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And then our Father, we pray for those who are our leaders in government, and those who, are, who hold senior positions in the NHS, uh, for medical chief medical officers and scientific officers and others who advise the government in London and in Stormont. And we pray, Lord, for them great wisdom. We recognise that uh, there are tensions and differences of opinion and there are difficulties that sometimes um, come. We, we pray that our politicians and leaders will not use this as an opportunity for selfish, uh, narrow political point scoring. Uh, but that they will constructively work together to try and come to the best conclusions and actions that will benefit all of us. We recognise that there are difficult choices, the choice between shutting down to such an extent that we limit the spread of the virus, that the cost of uh, many other things, the economy and other uh, health cares and concerns and so on, and in trying to find the right balance in these things, Lord, we pray that you will give our leaders great wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, Lord, we pray for leaders of the world and for presidents and prime ministers, for kings and queens, and for those, Lord, who have um, great responsibility. We pray too, Lord, for the World Health Organization, Lord, we recognise that uh, there are tensions there and perhaps mistakes have been made. But in the midst of this crisis, Lord, we pray that they and the UN and the various um, national governments will be able to work constructively together to bring us through this time of crisis. Perhaps in due course, there will be investigations and inquiries and things to learn. But Lord, in this time of crisis, we pray that world leaders 
will be able to cooperate well together, that they'll be able to uh, share uh, their best um, science and, um, and, and medical knowledge and experience uh, so that, Lord, things like uh, the development of a vaccine might be accelerated successfully as world leaders and governments and the World Health Organization cooperate constructively together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we join together as we share in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit Go with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. So friends, that's our uh, Sunday morning service concluded. And um, I trust that next Sunday you will tune in again. Uh, maybe you will read the end of um, uh, John chapter 12 and those last couple of verses uh, in chapter 20 that I referred to. And we'll try and answer that difficult question as to why there are some uh, who don't believe.